Before we talk about Rudolf Reddy, let me familiarize you with the Beethoven Tempus Sonata, Opus 31, Number 2. The piece starts out with what might be a theme, but if it's a theme, it's a strange theme. This theme is made up of three parts, a quiet opening arpeggio, a descending scale with repeated notes, and a turn-like cadence formula at the end. As strange as this theme is, it's similar to the simpler theme we saw in the Beethoven Opus 49 number 2. That theme started with an emphatic opening based upon an arpeggiation, while the tempest starts on a quiet arpeggio. Both themes have contrasting second parts. The tempest theme is repeated transposed up a minor third. While this seems like a strange modulation, it actually makes sense. The opening phrase starts on the dominant and moves to the tonic at the downbeat after the start of the eighth notes. This second statement of the theme starts on the dominant of the relative major and moves to the relative major at the downbeat after the start of the eighth notes. This statement is longer than the first and includes some going to music. A new idea appears in measure 20. It starts with an arpeggio in the bass, which is answered by a soft quarter note figure that surrounds the dominant pitch. This looks a lot like an antecedent and consequent phrase structure. So in retrospect, maybe everything that came before this was some kind of an introduction. But how can that be? For this to be the first theme, it should probably repeat, and it doesn't. Well, actually it does but it's up a step. And then only the first half repeats up a step again. And then the first half repeats four more times up a step each time. That doesn't seem like the kind of structure we should have in arrived at music. It seems more like going to music. The second theme, made up of falling eighth note patterns, follows that in the dominant. After the second theme, there's more going to music, which ends at the start of the development, still in the dominant key. The development starts out with the same kind of soft arpeggio that started the piece, but this time based on a tonic triad. This arpeggio then appears a half step higher on a D-sharp diminished chord, and then again on an F-sharp major chord. After that, the tempo picks up to allegro with a repeat of the music that had the sort of antecedent consequent theme, but this time in F sharp minor.
hey, maybe that really is the first theme. It changes chords with each iteration, very much like it did before, for the same number of measures, 20. A passage containing closure redundancies follows. These closure redundancies wind down and end with a scale that leads us back to tonic at the recap. When we looked at the Opus 49 number 2, we didn't even bother to look at the recap because it was not significantly different from the exposition. Here we see that the recap is radically different. While we've had no lyrical song-like melodies in the piece so far, we get one here, growing out of the opening arpeggio. This is followed by the falling eighth note pattern from the beginning. The second arpeggio appears and it also is followed by a new lyrical melody. If this material constitutes an introduction, why does Beethoven bring it back at all? Why doesn't he just launch into the antecedent consequence structure we thought might really be the first theme? Surely that will follow now as it did in the exposition. Well, it doesn't. Beethoven launches into some new going to music that leads quickly to the second theme, this time in tonic. From that point on, the recap proceeds as expected. So what really is the first theme? I don't think it can be the antecedent consequent idea, as strong a theme as it seems to be, because it doesn't reappear in the recap. On the other hand, while the material at the beginning is amorphous, it becomes a much more clear-cut theme when it returns in the recap. It is as if there was something missing at the beginning that is supplied when the theme comes back in the recap. In Beethoven's Tempest Sonata, the recap is not a mere repetition of the exposition. It is instead a fulfillment of the exposition. Probably the person most often associated with the concept of motivic transformation is Rudolf Reddy. Reddy wrote two books on the subject, Thematic Process in Music and Thematic Patterns and Sonatas of Beethoven. In Thematic Patterns and Sonatas of Beethoven, Reddy gives us his thoughts on the Tempest Sonata. Reddy identifies three motives at the opening of the piece, the arpeggio, the falling eighth note scales, which he calls a melismatic phrase, and the turn pattern at the end. He shows that the melismatic pattern, the falling scale, is the basis of much of the piece. Reddy actually sees two different patterns in the scale. The first skips the second note of the pattern, the G. This note is skipped because it sometimes acts as a non-chord tone and isn't therefore structural to the pattern. In the second pattern, Reddy treats all of the notes as dissonances except for the last one, which he omits. The patterns appear at the beginning of the first movement, but Reddy also finds them in the theme of the last movement. After the first theme, the music starts a section of what I labeled going to music in the tonic key, D minor. Of this section, Reddy writes, This section would appear to be the first quote-unquote real thematic section. 
for the opening section which precedes it, both in its unusual harmonic chorus and its constant change of tempo, bears, as do many opening sections in Beethoven's music, the character of an improvisational introduction. And in common with these quote-unquote introductions, this one spells in outline all of the structural ideas from which the work is built. This first quote-unquote real thematic statement is based on what I call the antecedent consequent theme. The antecedent is made from the opening arpeggio motive, and the consequent is made from the turn motive. This theme is followed by a number of other statements, each one in sequence a step higher. Reddy believed that this stepwise pattern is based on the scale idea, his melismatic phrase, in ascending rather than descending form. Another scale pattern is formed in the right hand of the piano, about halfway through the passage. Reddy labels the second theme as a derivation of the scale idea, the melismatic phrase, with a hint of an arpeggio at the beginning and he sees the accompaniment that precedes it as coming from the turn pattern. The going to music that follows the second theme is also based on the turn pattern. Reddy finds evidence to back up his interpretation in Beethoven's sketch for the work. Notice that while the opening of the sketch is similar to the finished piece, the turn motive is missing. Since the turn motive is missing at the beginning, it should also be missing elsewhere. This is in fact the case. The turn motive is missing from what Reddy labels as his quote-unquote real thematic section. Without the turn motive acting as a consequent, the arpeggio sounds nothing like a theme. It's obviously just a sequence based on the opening arpeggio. Typical going to music. One of the more far-fetched claims in Reddy's interpretation is that the bass line of this going to music is based on the descending scale from Reddy's melismatic phrase. The sketch gives Reddy's idea credence because while it shows the going to music ending with the scale on the bass line, it doesn't start out that way. While it seems to most of us that basing a sequence on a simple ascending scale would be an obvious idea, it apparently wasn't to Beethoven at the time he wrote the sketch. Beethoven created the baseline scale as a revision, an afterthought. Maybe he did get the idea from the melismatic phrase. Also in the sketch, the scale in the right hand is omitted. Maybe this was also an afterthought based upon the melismatic motive. For me, the biggest question about the Tempest Sonata is, just what is the first theme? Reddy's study of Beethoven's sketch answers that, for me, in the negative. It can't be the antecedent consequent idea, because that idea doesn't exist in the sketch. Okay, fine, but isn't all of this a little far-fetched? Isn't it a little hard to believe that any composer, including Beethoven, consciously does this kind of thing? Well, I do. This is exactly how I compose, and I was composing this way long before I ever heard of Rudolf Reddy. I can't remember exactly everything that my composition teachers taught me, but I do know that some motivic transformation was on the menu. I suspect they got the idea from one of their teachers, and one of those teachers was Arnold Schoenberg. I studied with at least three teachers who studied with Schoenberg. I say at least three because Schoenberg had so many students, it's hard to keep track of them all. In addition to teaching at various universities around Los Angeles, Schoenberg also taught classes at his house. One of my teachers, Leonard Stein, was Schoenberg's assistant. He studied with Schoenberg for years and later became the director of the Schoenberg Institute in Los Angeles. One of my other teachers, Nelson Kies, only studied with Schoenberg for a few weeks, taking classes at his home. Schoenberg was tremendously influential and his way of thinking permeated mid-20th century compositional practice. 
In his book, Style and Idea, edited by Leonard Stein, he explained his take on motivic transformation. Everyone with a knowledge of music is aware that each piece has certain parts, the smallest which always recur, the so-called motives. Though it is not always possible or easy to follow the function of these motives in the most modern compositions, there is no doubt that it can almost always be done in the classics. It is always the same material which is being handled. Every form, no matter where or how it appears, can be traced back to these motives. The same idea is at the base of everything. Reddy also had a Schoenberg connection. He premiered one of Schoenberg's breakthrough pieces, the Dry Klavierstücke Opus 11, and he published the first scholarly article about Schoenberg's music about that piece. Schoenberg wrote him a thank you note, which Reddy reproduced in one of his books. Clearly, Reddy was proud of his Schoenberg connection. While I believe the idea of motivic transformation came to mid-20th century composers through Schoenberg, I also believe that it was around earlier. I believe that Marx knew about it. I believe that Beethoven knew about it. Bach knew about it. Numerous composers knew about it. It's an idea that's been around a long time. While the idea of motivic transformation is important, it is possible to create different types of melodies without it. We'll talk about that next time.